name. Amen. Amen. I loved uh, last weekend's message. Cap started the message by asking what some of y'all's favorite movies were. And that was telling, let me just tell you. I loved when I heard somebody yell, Talladega Nights, come on. I mean, my goodness. Um, there's many different movies that popped into my mind when he asked that question. One of them was uh, the movie Home Alone. Oh, isn't that just a classic, though? And uh, there's one particular scene, I, I believe it's in, the, in Home Alone 2, and uh, they're, they're, they wake up late, and they're headed to the airport, and uh, Kevin is following his father. Do you remember this scene? Yep. Kevin's following his father, and uh, they're, they're running through the airport, and next thing you know, uh, Kevin's reaching down to fumble with something, and so he stops, and his father keeps moving towards the gate. And uh, as, as Kevin begins to fumble with whatever he was fumbling with, you can see that there are some moments where he's looking up to just stay on track with where his father is heading. But there was one particular moment where he looked down, and next thing you know, his father went right, and there was another man wearing a trench coat very similar to him that went left. So when Kevin took his eyes off of his father, he ended up following the wrong guy. What's interesting is his family was heading to Miami and he ended up in New York. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And obviously the film is incredibly epic, but I think it's a really good picture for each of us in here that when we get our eyes off the Father, when we get our eyes off our heavenly Father, hello, somebody. God was taking us to Miami and we ended up in New York. I don't know about you, but I like the beach a lot better than New York City. And um, I think that this is just a, a beautiful picture for you and I on what distraction can do in our lives. See, distraction dismantles God's purpose and calling in our life. Cap talked about purpose uh, last week, and I think that there's no question that God has a calling for each of us, that God has a purpose for each of us. But how many of you know um, that his greatest purpose for you and I is to be known by him? It's to be in relationship with him. It's to be connected to him. It's to be intimate with him. And I think in Western culture, sometimes we miss this because there's many of us in culture that would call ourselves Christians. And somewhere along the line, we've mistaken being a Christian for being a convert rather than a disciple. How many of you know that Jesus um, didn't just call us to come to the altar and surrender, but he called us to, to leave something and begin to follow him? I'm talking about orienting your whole life around being a disciple. It's just so interesting. I, I talk to so many people in my life in these particular days, and I ask them how they're doing, and their first response back to me is busy. 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 I, I love what uh, Dan Hazuka says. He's a mentor of mine. He's been walking life a lot longer than me. He says, busy. Don't say busy. That's being under Satan's yoke. Your life is full. But the reality is that somewhere along the way, we, we, we sort of handed over um, our schedules, our calendars. It's like, it's like we're, we're just kind of moving with the current of culture rather than saying, man, wait a second here. God, how should I orient my life? How, how, should, how should I, what, what should I say yes to? God, what are you inviting me into? I love what Matthew 6.33 says. It says, seek first. Somebody say first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All things will be added to you. I think sometimes we seek all these other things and we expect the kingdom of God to be added to us. We wonder why we're walking around fearful. We wonder why we're walking around with a lack of peace. We wonder why when we look at our future, it's hopeless. We wonder why we struggle with loving the people around us. How many of you know that I believe today and in this hour and in this, in this moment, even in history, as we head towards the fall and another election, 
I believe that this is a timely message for you and I to get our focus back on Jesus. Somebody say focus. And I was reminded of this in my own life recently. I've just been, for whatever reason, in this particular season, I found myself uh, just being distracted. You ever been there? Anybody in the room? You just, you know, you've, you're, your mind's wandering, you're, you're drifting, and um, you're not being deliberate, but you're drifting. You know, without vision, you'll drift into the future. Nobody drifts to a desired destination. That's why when we look at our future, do we see Jesus? If not, we're drifting. We're drifting away from what he has for, for each of us. And so in this season, there are a couple uh, things that happened to me recently where God was challenging me. Hey, man, get your eyes back on me. I was helping my stepfather pour some patios in our backyard, and we were doing some stuff in his truck afterwards, and he asked me to go around and grab something, and so I hurried and scurried around the back of his truck, and I was moving real fast, and then bam! Oh, I just woke some of y'all up. Smack dab right into a two by four. Man, I about knocked myself out. You have to understand that I've had so many concussions playing football that it's real easy to get another one. That's why I've been tripping on my words today. Still recovering. Then I was, uh, I was meeting with a group of CEOs this past Thursday and uh, I had to leave for a little bit and then I came back and I stopped to get a Scooter's coffee. Nothing like a little Scooter's coffee in the afternoon. And I've got my bag and I'm ready to go into this meeting. And uh, I'm in the bathroom using the restroom real quick and I've got my coffee and I'm kind of in a hurry and I turn the corner and I run right into a wall. Bam, hot coffee all over the front of my shirt. Somebody say, get it together. Somebody say, fix your focus. These uh, two silly illustrations just reminded me that we can get distracted, right? And I think it's so interesting because distraction never leads to the outcomes that we desire. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking about why is this message so pertinent for this hour? Because I believe that God desires a church that is carrying out his presence and his power in this hour. See, distraction uh, takes us away from being able to carry that out. And we're gonna see it here um, in, in the text today, and I wanna go straight to it in Luke chapter 10, uh, starting in, in verse 38. I've already sort of set the context for where we're at in scripture today. But it says this in the word, it says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet. Somebody say sat. sat. She sat there listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Somebody say distracted. See, what's interesting about this is Martha was distracted by a good thing. I don't think that her motivation uh, had any sort of ill intent in this particular story. But I think we need to catch this this morning. This wasn't in my notes. notes uh, I'm just giving you some extra takeaways here. But write this down in your notes. A good thing becomes a bad thing when it supersedes the best thing. A good thing, let me say it again. Yeah, I'll say it again for you, Bert, come on. Hey, a good thing becomes a what? A bad thing when it supersedes the best thing, okay? We, 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 need, to, we need to understand this because so often I think when we teach the, the story of, of Martha and Mary, it's like, oh, Martha, she's distracted and she's a perfectionist and she's just the one that is doing all the time. And then there's Mary. Oh, she's got it figured out. You're gonna see it here in a second. She's just taking a seat. She's chilling. And isn't it funny, like in life, it is, it is quite funny that, you know, we're all wired differently. Somebody say differently, right? We're just different. I mean, I see the, even in my own children, my oldest, Judah, he's like super diligent. You tell him to do something, he's gonna do it from A to Z. He's gonna get it all done and tidied up. Then I got my son, Royce. Oh boy, y'all know Royce, right? You've heard about Royce, the one that's sneaking in the pantry. He just, fought, you know what, he just, whenever, whenever a task is given to all three kids, somehow, some way, he just finds his way out of it. 
I don't know what it is. He, 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 you know, he's not, he's not contributing. And, and, you know, this is what's happening here. Martha's like, wait a second. I'm doing a good thing trying to prepare a meal for Jesus. And Mary's over here just chilling, just relaxing. Can somebody help me around here? That's what she's thinking, right? So she goes to Jesus and she says this, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Like, help, help me. Somebody help me out. But it's so interesting in this moment because Jesus uses this, uses this as a teaching moment for Martha. Listen to his response here. He says, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. Doesn't that just feel like life sometimes? Just overwhelmed by the worries and cares of this life. You got a mortgage to pay, you got a job to do, you got kids to raise, you got a yard to mow, you got trash to take out. Come on, is anybody with me in here today? But here's what Jesus says. And this is what I want us to get today. I could read this verse and pray and close us out because here's the one takeaway, here it is. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Somebody say one thing. one thing. One thing. One thing to be concerned about. And Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. See, see this, is, this is what I call the Mary factor. Somebody say the Mary factor. Mary. Being willing to choose the one thing. The one thing. Luke 10, 42, there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. I don't know about you, but I want the presence of God to be magnetic in my life. I'm talking about when my two feet hit the floor in the morning, it's like, ooh, I'm just drifting right into my secret place. Magnetic pull into the presence of God. But oftentimes that's not the case, friends. Oftentimes, the magnetic pole is right to this thing right here. Anybody with me? Now, I'm not here to um, try to make this a bad thing. But either you and I will control this thing or this thing will control us. In 2007, Steve, Steve Jobs stood on a stage like this and introduced the iPhone to us. This thing's actually pretty incredible and it's actually, there's some really good things um, that we're able to do through this thing. But there was a day when, when, this, was, when this is what it was. Ooh, a Sony Ericsson. He says, I bet it still has a charge. Yeah, bro, when they, when, when they were making the upgrades, they weren't like, you know, finagling with your battery and stuff so that you go buy the new one. You know what I'm saying? Wow, this thing could do two things. I could call somebody or text somebody. Wow, some of y'all young folks don't even know what this is, do you? You're going, where's the camera on that thing? How do I Snapchat somebody? There ain't no selfies on this thing, let me just tell you. These were the days, though, weren't they? Simple, definitely more simple. And um, it's interesting because I just, uh, you know, for me even personally, like this, this is the source for a lot of distraction in my life. And I think if all of us were honest in here, it probably is for, for many of us in the room. Not all of us, but the reality is, is if you and I began to do a screen audit on how much time we spend on these devices, it would probably be startling. I mean, I think, I think I'm averaging like four hours a day on a screen, but here's what's interesting. If I went around in the church and asked why you're not in a group right now, you would say it's because you don't have time. Don't, don't let me look at that Netflix account. Oh, don't, don't let me pull open how, how long you're on Instagram every week. And, and here's the thing, I'm not here to shame you. I'm here to, I'm here to help you get aware about the real issue at stake. 
Because again, if we get our eyes off Jesus and we have a magnetic pull towards all these things that aren't really bringing fulfillment, satisfaction, or life to us, we're gonna end up in New York when God wanted us to be in Miami. I don't want you to miss out on your purpose or the call that God has on your life. I wanna see you fulfill everything that he has for you. I, I, want, I want you to be ready. Somebody say ready. ready. Come on, somebody say stay ready. ready. So I don't have to get ready. Right. Luke chapter 12, I love this. We read it in today's reading. It says this, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. We gotta stay ready. We gotta stay ready. We gotta stay prayed up. We, we, we gotta get with him. Because how many of you know that you and I are the hope of the world? Jesus left so that he could send his Holy Spirit to fill you and I. We're like little Christ running around in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools. Come on, there's work for us to do, church. Are you with me? He fills us up so that we can be poured out. You and I don't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. The question is, when opportunity shows up, are you giving out breadcrumbs or loaves of bread? I don't know about you, but there, there are some moments in my life where, man, I miss it because I wasn't filled up. I wasn't prayed up. I wasn't ready for the moment. As a matter of fact, I just all week and even after the events that transpired yesterday, um, I, I was just thinking about these moments. Remember when Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he began to weep, to weep, he was crying. Or I think of the, um, I think of the prophet Jeremiah. You know, you know, in that day, man, can you imagine preaching the gospel like he did? And, and man, some scholars submit that there, there was no conversions. Like, can you imagine that? Like you're, you're preaching the word and, and it's just falling on deaf ears. But he wept. He wept over the fact that his people just couldn't, couldn't get on, on the right path with God. And what I found in my life is the most effective ministry I do is when God breaks my heart for what breaks his but I've gotta get close to his heart to understand what breaks his heart. This is, this is why we can't be distracted in this hour. We, we, know, we say this, that if you find your woe, you find your flow. And how many of you know that there is, there's, there's woe and there's burden that God is placing on us? And it's oftentimes, just like Kappas said last week, just think about who you were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Never forget what God pulled you out of. It might have been three months ago. But most often, where you were most broken, that's gonna be the assignment for you to serve. You see what I'm saying in the house of God today? We've gotta, we've gotta be ready. Somebody say, be ready. ready. We gotta be ready because there's a, there's a ambition for you and I to fulfill. And um, I wanna give you some, some really pra practical takeaways because you're like, yes, OC, I, want, I wanna get focused. I wanna be aligned. I wanna be ready so I don't have to get ready. I wanna do all those things. But tell me how I do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you five ways to become more focused in a distracted world. Can I do that? T take your, uh, take your um, note app out right now and write number one down. Find your secret place. I've already sort of alluded to this, Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to the Father in private then your father who sees everything will reward you. In our story today, uh, Mary is not in private, she's in the living room, but she's doing what Jesus says is the most necessary thing for you and I. 
See, what Martha was doing wasn't bad, but what Mary was doing was better. I think it's interesting that when Jesus is teaching us about prayer, the first thing that he's teaching us is you need to find a place. Somebody say a place. Now that's gonna look different for each of us. For some of you, it's gonna look like a quiet room or it's gonna look like a chair at your dining room table or maybe it's in your car. For some of you, you like to get up and you like to go on a walk and sit at a park or there's others of you in here that it's, it's grabbing a coffee at Starbucks and sitting on the outdoor patio. I don't know what it is, but you need to find a place, a secret place. Why? Because here it is. You ready for it? The secret place is the secret sauce. The secret place is the secret sauce. Why? Because it's where we receive hope. It's where we receive peace. It's where we receive love. There's so many of us that are serving Jesus before we sit, and as a result, we're ineffective. How many of you know that we, we need to sit before we serve? Somebody say, we need to sit before we serve. Now, what's interesting is Jesus, we know this about his life, that the secret place wasn't just a place for him, it was a practice. Somebody say a practice. This is, why, this is why we gotta do this every single day. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things are added to us. It doesn't mean that every day I go into the secret place, I come out floating, just ready to go. Nothing overwhelms me. I'm just cruising. It's just peaches and rainbows. No, that's not the case. But how many of you know that there's something powerful? We just read it in Joshua chapter one, meditate on the word of God day and night. There's something about just catching a word that becomes an anchor for my day. Is anybody with me? That, that when stuff hits the fan, I can go back to my anchor. I, I've got a word in my heart, hidden in my heart. And here's what I found is most often what I receive in the secret place is what I'm to give away and serve and give to the people around me for that particular day. The problem is, is some of us, we don't have a word on our lips because we never got in the secret place. We gotta find our place. Somebody say, you gotta find the secret place. The second thing is this, is you gotta incorporate spiritual disciplines. Ah, oh, some of y'all are like, I don't like that. Disciplines, what are you talking about? Don't make God a calculation and don't make it stuffy. And, but look, listen to what 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says. I love this verse of scripture. It says, Discipline yourself. Somebody say discipline yourself. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is just slightly beneficial, but godliness is beneficial for all things since, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I wrote this down in my notes. You can write this down. I said, when you're born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your disciplines. Your life is moving in the direction of your disciplines. It's shaping you, it's forming you, and uh, I'm actually just reminded of this this week. I'm, I'm thankful to be surrounded by people that call me to the disciplines even when I feel like I'm falling short in the disciplines. I was, uh, I was riding the elliptical next to, next to Chad. What up, Chad, how you doing, man? This past Monday, um, Chad and I, riding on the elliptical before we're, gonna, before we're gonna lift really heavy on Mondays. You know what I'm talking about. And I was telling him, I was talking to him about how I've, I've been experiencing a little bit of distraction, specifically in my quiet time. You, you ever experience those seasons where there is a lot of overwhelm, you've got decisions to make, there's things that are happening in your life, and, and, and you get into that secret place and you open up your word and you read through a chapter or you read through a few scriptures and your mind is just, it's just like all over the place. Have you ever had that? Ever have you experienced any of that? Well, I've been experiencing some of that. And, but, I, but I'm like, man, I'm always challenging people to be present in his presence, but I don't even feel like I can do that. And I, and I think I was saying something along the lines of like, man, when I, when I start feeling that way, like what's even the point? And he, and he, and he said, no. 
you just, you maintain that discipline and you trust that even in the discipline, God's working. Even though you're coming out of that discipline and maybe you're not receiving something so incredible, keep showing up day after day. Stay committed to the discipline because the discipline is profiting you something. It's moving you in the direction that you want to move in. This is why we choose discipline, y'all. I got a couple people that are getting this this morning. Come on, are you with me? Why don't we just give them a praise right now for five seconds? The discipline is a bridge for connection with him. It's not so that you can say that you're some spiritual person or man. I'm a self-feeder and I get in my word every day. I think this is, you know, honestly, if we're honest, when we read this story, you know, as I was considering it, I'm really, I'm really pulling to the surface what Jesus is trying to teach Martha. But I think that there is this, when we look at Jesus' ministry, um, something that we see time and time again that I want us to catch this morning is over 12 times in the New Testament, I was studying this this week, Jesus, whenever he would do a miracle or heal somebody or minister to a group, it always said that the reason why he did it was because he had compassion in his heart. So for me, I see a connection to consecration and compassion. Jesus was willing to get away with his father every single day, be filled up, and then when he was met with a need, what did he have? Compassion. He had compassion. And right now, we've got compassion fatigue in the church, but I think it's because we have consecration fatigue. We're showing up on a Sunday 1.8 times a month catching a regurgitated message from a pastor and expecting to go and give away bread loaves out in the culture. It ain't gonna happen that way. Come on, somebody, are you with me today? I think he's inviting us into the more. We've got to incorporate these spiritual disciplines because as we do, what it does is it fosters an opportunity to connect with the heart of God. We do it through things like solitude, scripture, prayer, Sabbath, fasting, and service. These are just mechanisms that connect us to the heart of God so that we can continue to walk out our spiritual formation, our sanctification, so to speak, until he calls us home. So in a world full of distractions, if we're gonna get our focus back, we gotta find our secret place. We've gotta incorporate spiritual disciplines. And number three, we've gotta start saying no. Say no. no. Say no. no. Some of y'all haven't said that in a while. Feels good to say no, doesn't it? Feels empowering to say no, doesn't it? Amen. No is a full sentence. When somebody asks you, hey, can you do this? You can say no. No. Now, it's interesting because I was, I was thinking about this and I really do believe that one practical thing that I would challenge everybody in here to do is I would, I would walk away from this experience today and I would go do a commitment audit. Go review your calendar, go review the things that you're committed to and ask yourself the question, is this serving, is this serving me in this season or is it not? Is it, is it a distraction at this juncture uh, in, in my journey? I think that so often uh, we, f we struggle with saying no because we love to please man. I love what Galatians 1.10 says. It says, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, here it is, I would not be Christ's servant. There's some of us in this room that we, we've, we've overcommitted and overextended ourselves because we lack identity. We still fear man instead of fearing God. So, so we, would, we would just rather just go with the flow. And we would just, you know, rather overcommit to 
you know, 80 baseball games for the first grader and then go do this and go do that and maybe hit church once every three months and it's lucky if I can get in my word and by golly, small group, what are you talking about? Small group, I, I have no time for that. And then we wonder, we wonder why young people are leaving the church in groves. We, 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 we carry a responsibility in this room to set our hearts on fire to show the next generation what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. You know what I love about the Gospels and what challenges me every time is when Jesus would call one of his apostles, they always had to leave something in order to follow something. I think of Peter dropping his nets to follow Jesus. When I think about this idea of saying no, what do you need to say no to in this season so you can say yes to the better thing? See, see Martha wasn't saying yes to a bad thing, but she failed to say yes to a better thing. Somebody say better. There's a better thing, and I don't know what it is for you, but I believe that if you're gonna get your focus back, you gotta start saying no. The fourth one is this. I'm gonna go quick through these last few. Is you need to schedule a clarity break. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Now, I love this because Jesus just understand, you, you see this rhythm in his ministry. And I believe that this is the rhythm that we should adopt. He would retreat and then he would return. He would engage, he would do ministry and then he would retreat and then he would return. Some of us have been in the game so long that it's like, we're just in survival mode. We're on autopilot. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, but I am just, I've just been doing this job for 10 years, so I'm gonna do it. And this is just, it just, and I get it. I'm raising three kids and I'm just telling you, sometimes autopilot just feels like the right thing to do. I don't wanna think about another thing. I don't wanna make another decision. So we're just gonna stay right here and we're just gonna keep rowing the boat. Is anybody with me today? But how many of you know that sometimes you've gotta press pause to get a clarity break, to actually stop living in the life and work on the life? It's like you gotta go to the mountaintop with God. You, you ever been in an airplane? Isn't it interesting how you can just see for miles and miles and miles the higher you get? Some of you just gotta climb a little bit higher in this season through a clarity break. You gotta get a new picture. You gotta set your sights forward. That's number four. Number five, here it is, final one. We gotta walk in the pace of grace. What's your pace been like lately? What's your pace been like lately? The thing I love about Jesus is he was always urgent, but he was never running. He was always urgent, but he was never running. Jesus moved at the pace of grace. And here's what I've learned is that when you and I, when you and I get in alignment with God's invitation for the season, he does exceedingly abundantly above all we could think, ask or imagine. I kind of laugh at the fact that Chick-fil-A shuts down every Sunday and, and you know you hear that and you're like, well, they're leaving a ton of revenue on the table and yet every year they outpace like every other fast food place. There, there's something about when we align ourselves with God's principles and we move at his pace, he does beyond what we, what, what we could ever do ourselves. And that's what grace is. Friends, grace is getting what you and I don't deserve. And when you and I get what we don't deserve, guess who gets the glory? He does. God gets the glory when you and I trust him, when we begin to move at his pace. So I think today that as we, as we close here today, I want us to stand to our feet and I want us to think about, I want us to think about our season. Because for some of us, You can relate to Kevin in the airport. And maybe you're not fumbling around in your daddy's bag, but maybe it is the phone or, or maybe it's a, something you've committed to, but there's something in your life right now that is causing you to take your eyes off of Jesus. And today you're saying, nope, it's time for me to lay that distraction down and get refocused. Somebody say refocus where when we fix our focus on Jesus, he says that he keeps in perfect peace those whose minds 
Stay fixed on him. Am I speaking to anybody in here today that wants peace in this season? Is, am I speaking to anybody today that wants to, to, move, to move at the pace of grace in this season? Is, am I speaking to anybody that wants exceedingly abundantly above all they could think, ask, or imagine in this place? Am I speaking to anybody that wants to make a difference, that wants to walk out their God-given purpose, that wants to leave nothing on the table? Come on, am I speaking to anybody in here today? <laughs> Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. And the beauty is, is what you receive, you now, can give away to all those that are around you. Church, he's called us to one thing in this season, and it's to love him supremely so that we can love others supernaturally. God, thank you for this word. Thank you for how you're moving in our hearts. God, we receive it. And even now, starting with me, I say, God, I lay down every distraction. I lay down everything that's causing me to take my eyes off of you. Today I recommit to making you the main thing. Today I recommit to choosing the better thing. God, I thank you that there's work to be done, there's service to do, there's purpose to be had, there's callings to fulfill. But God, I pray that we would fulfill those callings, those purposes, those assignments, from a place of overflow. That God, we would be filled up so that we can pour out in this season. God, we know that the world desperately needs the church in this hour. We thank you that we're the hope of the world. That you've called us to be a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And so God, for that we say yes, Lord. We pray you would continue the work in us. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people shouted, amen. Now before I close, before I close, I want to finish just like we do every single week because in a room this size I know I'm speaking to some folks that you walked into here and a, it was a friend that invited you and uh, if you're really honest you would describe your life as distracted you would say I've never come to a place where I've wanted to fix my focus on Jesus I've never come to a place where I've wanted to walk with him but today everything could change in 2007, in a Hollywood video parking lot, that's how I would describe my life. I was distracted. I took this life that God gave me, this beautiful gift of life, and I said, God, I've got it from here. Let me go my own way. And that, that my own way took me into darkness. It took me into all sorts of chaos. It took me into all sorts of, of uh, missing out on all that God had. I had a lack of peace. And that describes some of you in here today, that you showed up into this place and you're wondering if there's more to this life than what you're experiencing. I'm here to declare today that there is, that you were created to be a son and daughter, to know him and to make him known, that he created you with purpose and for a purpose. But it starts with getting connected to the vine. You've gotta be connected to the source. You've gotta walk with him day by day. And so in this place, here's all it takes. It takes you recognizing that in your, sinful in your sinful condition, you're disconnected from a holy God. But in a moment, you can turn and you can accept his forgiveness and you can expect, you can expect a new life in Christ because of what he did on the cross, not because of what you and I have to do. Is anybody thankful for the grace of God? that you serve a God that left heaven and came to earth and lived the life that you couldn't and died the death you deserved. And when he hung on that cross, he said, it is finished. And he created the pathway for you to be restored back into right relationship with the God that made you. So if you wanna make peace with Jesus today, the band's gonna play. I wanna invite you forward. It'll be my privilege to lead you to Christ today. Come on.